Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Bigfoot Tales. I'm your host Dan Susi coming to you from the coast of Maine. Uh, <clears throat> I want to apologize for uh, such a long lapse of uh, filming uh, and posting videos but uh, been really busy this month for the last several months and uh, just haven't had time to go out and do any research like I wanted to or, uh, uh, put up any of these videos but uh, we've got one now. We're going to talk about two stories of uh, strange wild men uh, hailing from different parts of uh, the nation and uh, the first story uh, we're going to be um, uh, taking a look at uh, actually jumping back in time 115 years to uh, August 5th of 1899 and we're going to look at an article in the Victoria Advocate newspaper and that's out of Victoria, Texas about a, uh, a wild man and uh, Later on, at the end of the story, we're going to do the uh, the best story. And this is also from uh, January of 1899, uh, out of uh, Crawfordsville, Indiana, uh, in the Daily Argus News. And uh, we'll talk about the uh, Kokomo Bigfoot. Uh, that's probably the most interesting one. But uh, we'll get right into uh, the uh, the main story that we have here. This is called The Wild Man of Wisconsin. Uh, ostensibly, this is in fact a human being, uh, and it quite likely is, uh, nothing but that. Uh, but essentially, he's a strange being who has frightened women for years. Comes out of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. And here's the article, we'll get into that, and then we'll talk about a couple of different points here. Uh, and it does come with a couple of illustrations that we'll. Uh, share after this story and uh, look at a couple of interesting points. Here's the story. Not since Black Bart, the highwayman, terrorized the northern peninsula of Michigan and part of Wisconsin has there been as much excitement in this region as there was this week owing to the capture of the wild man in the woods 50 miles from here. The strange creature is now in the jail here and is utterly unable to give any account of himself. He is evidently insane and has the peculiar cunning so often shown by lunatics. He refuses to utter any intelligible sounds, if indeed he is able to, after his long life of solitude in the woods, and the authorities are at a quandary as to what disposition to make of him. For a long time, reports have been coming to the office of Constable Burnett about a wild man having been seen here and there in the forest. The stories came from places far remote, but all tallied as to his general description, saying he was an aged man with beard and hair flowing over his face and shoulders and matted as though he had been in the woods, away from civilization for a long time. He was described as very difficult of approach, and as he made his way through the woods by a series of springs like those of a kangaroo, using both arms and legs in his strange methods of locomotion. Not much credence was placed in this feature of the stories, as it was supposed that those who saw the wild man were so scared or excited that to their imaginations he appeared to be springing through the air like an animal. So many reports were heard of the crazy man that farmers, hereabouts as well as other settlers, became decidedly timorous about leaving the women and children unprotected in their homes, lest he should come into the towns or settlements and attack somebody in his insane fury. A many requests were made of Constable Burnett that he should organize a posse and go forth to search for and capture the wild man. To all these, he was obliged to say that the whereabouts of the man were so much mystery that it would be foolish to begin a general search of the mighty forest, extending for miles in every direction, although the constable was as anxious as anyone that the fellow should be captured. Finally, however, the word was received here that the wild man had been seen in the woods at a place about 50 miles away, and that he could easily be captured, as he seemed to have no weapons or implements of defense, and Constable Burnett at once took a train to the nearest railroad station to where he was said to have been seen. There, he soon reorganized a posse of 50 men, and the search began. The party divided up into squads and began beating the woods in every direction, having arranged a signal to call all together if the man should be found and when the search had gone on a few hours, the signal was sounded by the squad headed by Constable Burnett. When the others gathered, they saw the object of their search sitting in the fork of a tree a short distance from the ground, 
and glaring wildly and angrily at the men who surrounded him. His only covering, aside from his long hair, was an old gunny sack twisted around his shoulders in the form of a robe, and he was indescribably dirty and repulsive-looking. The wild gleam in his eyes betrayed his insanity, and it was decided to use caution in capturing him. On his head was a dirty old kunkin scap, which was not at first noticed, it so matted and tangled was his hair. The circle around the tree was gradually narrowed down, leaving the wild man no chance for escape unless he were able to break through the ring of determined men who advanced upon him with ropes and clubs intent upon taking him alive. When the space separating the tree from the invaders was not more than ten feet, the wild man suddenly came to the tree with a howl of rage and rushed directly upon his pursuers. Toward the point he evidently selected for escape, all the men suddenly sprang, and in a moment the wild creature turned again, and with a peculiar spring which had been described in the sheriff, attempted to flee. He threw his weight upon both hands and his feet, and with a strong into the legs like a kangaroo, threw himself forward to land again upon his hands and feet six feet away. His remarkable both speed and this odd manner of locomotion completely surprised the pursuers, and he nearly escaped, but several who were fleet of foot ran in a roundabout course among the trees and headed him off. There ensued a terrific battle. The men sought to cast ropes around his limbs, but he struck and bit at them viciously. Half a dozen hands raised, seized him at once, but with marvelous strength for so old a man, he wriggled himself free from their detaining grass and sprang forward again. When he was captured a second time, one of the foremost in the posse threw himself upon the wild man and the two rolled upon the ground in a fearful struggle, striking and scratching at each other. The farmer endeavored to grasp on the throat of the wild man, but the latter was too wary and tore off the hand half a dozen times. Meanwhile, the rest of the posse were hovering on the two struggling men, seeking to lead aid to the, lend aid to their companion, to injure him by interference. Whilst the farmer, who was right the strange man, proved the stronger of the two, and succeeded in turning his adversary on his back. At once, a dozen strong men seized the wild man, and ropes were thrown around him, and he was rendered incapable of doing any further damage. A wagon was procured, and the man was hauled to a railroad station, and there he brought to this place. He appears to be about sixty years old, but cannot give any account of himself. Do not tell where he came from, although some of his mumblings have been construed to mean that he hails from Canada. This, however, the officials do not believe. By some, he is thought to be the man who was unaccounted for after the disastrous fire in Hinckley, Minnesota, in 1894. Or either living or dead at that time, except one man, and it is this creature who, crazed by the fear of the conflagration and the scenes he witnessed there, fled to the woods and has roamed there ever since, living on wild animals and birds and sleeping in hollow trees and caves. And that's the story, and here is a, a picture of this uh, wild man. Um, and again, this is just an artist rendering based upon, um, I would guess, either his own personal observance if he was there, uh, or uh, by stories that uh, and information that was fed to him by people that were or through uh, recorded reports of the people who were there. But if you look at this uh, picture, and I'm going to zoom in on a couple of points here, uh, we have the typical uh, long hair, uh, long beard, shaggy face uh, type of man about him. And if you look uh, at this, also along his arms, and also along the legs, uh, it appears as though uh, the artist has um, added or uh, recorded visually um, excessively long hair about him. Um, and also, if you look at the feet, uh, they seem to be a little bit oversized for what you would normally find um, in most artist rendering of people. Uh, a couple of reasons for this is number one, uh, perhaps uh, he wasn't very good at drawing feet and did the best he could with what he had. Or number two, could be that he has really big feet. Um, hence uh, the Bigfoot connection. Uh, now, was this person a Bigfoot? Was it not a Bigfoot? Hard to tell. Uh, we have some interesting um, 
points of discussion here in that uh, he appeared to be about 60 years old, um, and yet he was able to uh, uh, spring on all fours. And we do have um, Bigfoot sightings reports of Bigfoot uh, having uh, uh, means of locomotion by using all four limbs uh, running on hands and feet together. Um, so this kind of uh, fits in with that, um, but also you have his prejudice strength for uh, somebody of that age being able to fight off much younger men um, in a fight and uh, being able to try to run away from them. If there had not been so many of them, he probably would have got away, uh, but uh, the numbers were just uh, too much for him. Uh, but uh, this uh, other one here, uh, you look a little bit closer at his face and... Uh, uh, it kind of gives you uh, a, a little bit of an image of what we normally would think uh, or have heard that a uh, Bigfoot face might look like uh, up close, judging from some of the reports and stories that I've heard. And again, uh, we see the uh, uh, what appears to be hairy arms and legs. Uh, the robe that's about him, um, it actually looks more like uh, he made a shirt out of it and put it over his head, but... Uh, the actual report, uh, newspaper article, says that it was tied about his neck uh, like a robe. Um, it doesn't say that it, it was on him like a shirt. So um, i got to kind of wonder if maybe that part of this picture is there simply out of modesty's sake. Uh, or maybe not. It's hard to tell. Uh, but this is the Wisconsin Wild Man. Um, and... Uh, you know, part of the reason that I share these stories is I'm hoping people will uh, uh, take this research a little bit further in the local areas. Um, I just don't have the resources to travel around the country and dig into libraries and historical societies and, and various places and archives uh, looking for these stories and trying to iron them out and find out uh, whether or not these wild men stories, um, or at least some of them anyways, uh, were actually uh, Bigfoot encounters, uh, what we call Bigfoot today, or Sasquatch is more appropriate. Um, you have to remember that when we talk about Bigfoot, that term has only been around since the mid-50s. So, uh, But we'll leave it at that. Uh, second story that I want to quickly get into today is uh, actually from the Daily Argus News. It's from uh, Crawfordsville, Indiana. Um, and this one is dated January 21st of 1899. And this story is uh, very short. Uh, it's only about a paragraph long. Um, but uh, this one is actually the more interesting of the two, uh, based upon the in, you know the information shared in this. Again, this is from Kokomo, Indiana, uh, January of twenty-first of uh, eighteen ninety-nine. Uh, the piece, and it's just a filler piece. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of information here, but it's uh, headlined, Captures a Wild Man. Walks on all fours, is covered with hair, and fights like a demon. Kokomo, Indiana, January 21. Constable Elwood McCracken of North Urban Township brought to jail here a queer specimen of humanity captured at Poplar Grove. The man, who is practically nude when found, is partially covered with a thick, shaggy growth of grizzly hair from one to four inches in length. He was at first thought to be some wild animal, as he was crouching and walking on all fours between the benches of the church. Though evidently past eighty years of age, he is a Hercules in physique, and wild and vicious as a tiger. He felt like a demon on being captured. He can talk but little. He says his name is Jacobson, and that is all that could be got out of him. It is not known where he came from. The officers are at a loss to know what to do with him. <coughs> And again, it's, like I said, it's very short, not a whole lot of information, but what they do give here is uh, quite interesting. Um, number one is uh, partially covered with thick, shaggy growth of grizzly hair from one to four inches of length. Um, I'm not sure that he's uh, they're talking just about the head. Um, for somebody that uh, would be naked and in that position, I would say that they probably have a lot longer hair in their head than that. So I'm going to presume although I don't know factually at this point, um, that uh, that hair covered his body, uh, probably his arms and his legs. Um, he was uh, crouching and walking on all fours, and again we get into the four-limbed uh, locomotion um, 
tendency that we've heard from some, but not all, just a few Bigfoot sightings reports uh, that we've seen them uh, uh, as a means of a locomotion of using all four limbs. Um, and the age is 80 years old, but he's a Hercules in physique, wild and vicious as a tiger. Um, which means that he uh, had a pretty big, good build. He was strong, muscular, um, and uh, doesn't talk much. Says his name is Jacobson, according to the article here. And um, I'm not sure that he says his name is Jacobson, or maybe that's just the sounds that was coming out of him that said Jacobson, and he was speaking in some language that uh, uh, the constable and the others that were there uh, couldn't quite figure out what it was. Um, you know, a lot of times we hear foreign people that we're absolutely not familiar with uh, will talk, and, you know, as far as we're concerned, it's gibberish because we have absolutely no idea what they're saying. Um, but uh, in their language, uh, they're can perfectly understand what they're saying. So, I have a situation here that uh, quite possibly, um, you know, the uh, uh, the Jacobson is a word uh, that is not Jacobson in English language, but something entirely different in another language. So, but these are just a couple of stories. Just wanted to share them real quick with you. Um, I know a lot of people don't like long videos, so we're going to cut this as short as possible. I'm not going to do any. Uh, uh, real in-depth uh, uh, analysis here uh, but again like I said um, the reason I'm sharing these is I'm trying to get people to uh, uh, try to look into their local archives uh, you know, the various historical societies and libraries and newspaper publishers and, and all that and uh, look at some of these old stories about the wild men um, and if you spend as much time looking at them as I have, um, after a while you begin to see that quite a few of them actually have stories that could very easily have been encounters with what we call Bigfoot today. Um, I think the Sasquatch people have been here for thousands of years. Um, I don't know how many of them are left, but I think they're declining. And... Uh, It'd be interesting to see if we could actually find out what this uh, cryptid really is. And uh, at any rate, that's the end of my video. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you uh, like it and uh, share it. And uh, come back for more on uh, Bigfoot Tales. <laughs>